Hi Church. As you are aware, we have been advised to stay home today due to this weekend's spike in COVID cases. And as shocking and dismaying as this is for many of us, we know that our God is faithful and our God is a solid rock. Uh, in fact, though things around us may constantly change and with those changes is brought great uncertainty, um, we are told that we have a Heavenly Father who is unchanging, steadfast, and eternal. And that's exactly what we want to focus our time in our service around today. In Isaiah chapter 9, one of the titles that this Messiah, this one who is going to be sent for us, is called is the Everlasting Father. The one we can put our hope in, trust in, who never fails or disappoints. So wherever you are today, we pray that you will be reminded of the great comfort that we have in our everlasting God, despite all around us being shifting sand. Please allow me to open our time in a word of prayer. God, again, we find ourselves in a moment of uncertainty. Yet you are certain. We are dismayed, but you never fail. I pray that today we are able to know and experience your constant, gentle, and ever-present love for us so we can have hope for tomorrow. It's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Hey church, uh, we are now going to be singing a Christmas carol together, uh, O Holy Night. I hope that you can join me at home. Thus in lonely men 
for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease sweet hymns of joy with grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his hope Hey kids, uh, I can imagine that over the last week there's probably been a lot of change for you. Uh, you finished school, yay, that's really cool. But with that comes a lot of change, doesn't it? And some sadness too. You had to say goodbye to your teacher, you'll have a different one next year. So there's some change there. You've had to say goodbye to your classmates, and you'll have different classmates next year. So that's a bit of change and a bit of sadness. You may have even had to say goodbye to classmates who are moving to other schools and you may not see them for a long time. That's more change and more sadness. And then, just a couple of days ago, we were told that we need to stay inside. We can't gather together. We can't hang out with other people. We can't go out and do fun things anymore because we have to stop the spread of COVID again. Uh, that's more change. And instead of being at church together today and celebrating and singing and hanging out, we're at home watching church online again. That's a lot of change. Things keep changing. Things always change, don't they? And sometimes we wonder if we can rely on anything to stay the same. Well, as you know, Christmas is coming, and I'm sure you're super stoked about that. And at Christmas, uh, we are told that because Jesus came to earth, God is our forever Father. That means we can always rely on Him, always trust Him. We can always be sure that He will never, ever change. He will always be our loving, forgiving Dad. Even if we leave even if we change, even if we forget about him, he will never change. He will never leave us. He will never forget about us. Jesus tells us a story about this, and it goes like this. Jesus told them another story. Once a man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Give me my share of the property. So the father divided his property between his two sons. Not long after that, the youngest son packed up everything he owned and left for a foreign country where he wasted all his money in wild living. He had spent everything when a bad famine spread through that whole land. Soon, he had nothing to eat. He went to work for a man in that country and the man sent him out to take care of his pigs. He would have been glad to eat what the pigs were eating, but no one gave him a thing. Finally, he came to his senses and said, My father's workers have plenty to eat, and here I am, starving to death. I will go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against God in heaven and against you. I am no longer good enough to be called your son. Treat me like one of your workers. The youngest son got up and started back to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt sorry for him. He ran to his son and hugged him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against God in heaven and against you. 
I am no longer good enough to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, Hurry, bring the best clothes and put them on him. Give him a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Get the best calf and prepare it so he can eat and celebrate. This son of mine was dead, but has now come back to life. He was lost and now has been found. And they began to celebrate. The great news about God is that he never changes. He will always welcome us, always forgive us, always be there to bring us back home, even if we've changed, even if we've run away and done the wrong thing. He is our loving Heavenly Father and will always be that way. And this Christmas, as we remember the birth of Jesus, we can be reminded that He came to bring us to God. He grew up from that little baby we see in the manger, lived an amazing and perfect life and died to forgive us and bring us back to our perfect father. The one who always was, always will be there, loving and caring for us. In a world of change, we know that God is our forever father. I'm Alicia Harrison. And I have been in Narrabeen Baptist for four and a half years. So I am about to return home to New Zealand. Um, I've been here for nearly eight years and I'm going home because I'm going to become a registered nurse. I think God's been preparing me this for this for a very long time. Um, I've had countless opportunities of doing all sorts of types of nursing um, from elderly care to dental nursing to community support nursing um, and now registration so I think um, in my journey as a Christian um, God's really played like a massive role in preparing my heart to serve um, on mission and I went to Jordan two years ago and it really opened my eyes to the need for help um, and I wanted to be able to do something more um, and give and I think um, because I've always had a heart to care uh, it sort of started me thinking more about nursing. Well it excites me to be able to do something that I've always dreamt of doing um, and to be able to have an opportunity to, to show um, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit to others by loving and caring for them. I think what scares me is um, change, mm -hmm. so change of lifestyle, community, um, and also the, the workload, the study workload. I'm a bit nervous about that. Um, I've, yeah, I've not been back to school for years, so um, going back as an adult student is a bit scary. And as you go, you've been here for four and a half years, and you've blessed us in many ways, by the way. Like, yeah, what you've done with kids, and even babysitting my own children. <laughs> uh, you work in Jordan and everything. Well, uh, so we're gonna miss you, and what will you miss about NBC? Oh, I'll miss a lot. I'll miss the, the community and just being able to um, come down to church and connect with anyone, chat, and um, I'll miss my church mums especially, Maru and Robert. Um, they took me under their wing when I first got here and they've been a big part in my journey, sewing into me weekly and praying with me, guiding me. Oh, I think just prayer for um, strength, um, pray that God will just continue to go before me as he has and that he'll hold me tight. Um, and yeah, prayer for um, being able to manage the workload um, and I would love if you would continue to pray for my family also. Uh, what we like to do when people leave, we want to we want to send them, and so yeah, we want this to be like a sending prayer, um, sending you out from amongst our number to go and um, bless others. Uh, where are you going, so yeah, let's pray. 
Lord God, uh, I want to thank you for Alicia. Thank you for the way that you've brought her to NBC, uh, the way that you have used her personality and skills and gifts to be a blessing to us here uh, and around the world through what she's uh, done in Jordan as well, God. Uh, We want to thank you for leading her into this new uh, opportunity that you've opened up the doors for her and uh, you're sending her over there to be trained up, uh, to be able to use the compassion and love that comes from Christ to care for others. Uh, God, we pray that she will, um, yeah, she'll deal with the emotions uh, as she leaves. She'll deal with them well. And we pray that she'll find a great home, a great church, a great community to surround her there in New Zealand. Uh, we pray you'll give her energy and motivation with her studies. Uh, and Lord, in uh, her absence from her Australian family, God, we pray that you'll um, yeah, keep working in their lives. You'll protect them and draw their eyes towards Jesus. And Lord, now as a church, uh, we want to thank you for Alicia and we want to send her out uh, yeah, in your power and in your strength. Uh, may she be blessed and may she be a blessing. Uh, we send her in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May she go in peace to bring glory to your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Hey church, I'd love if you were to join me in prayer today. Uh, I want to start by reading to us from Luke chapter 2, verses 10 to 14, uh, when the angels speak to the scared shepherds in the hillside outside of Bethlehem. Uh, from verse 10, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, And lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. I just want to uh, pray with this in mind as we face uh, possibly a strange Christmas, as we gather here online yet again, uh, we want to be reminded of the words spoken from the angels to the shepherds, the words that bring peace and joy, that remind us of God with us, the Messiah wrapped in cloths lying in the manger, and all glory being given to God. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the reassuring words of the angels in this story, that fear is not necessary because we can have joy and peace because of the real fact that the Saviour has been born. We know with great assurance not only the birth of this Saviour, but the perfect life, the sacrificial death, and the glorious resurrection and ascension, that we can look back on this event knowing that we have even more reason than these shepherds to have peace and joy, uh, because God is with us, uh, with us wrapped up and in that manger, uh, but with us now internally through the Holy Spirit, uh, that peace and that joy may resonate within us. We know Jesus to be the Messiah, your very real presence, your Saviour, the King of all the earth. And we want to join with the angels in giving glory to God in the highest heaven. For all you have done, for your mighty works, Uh, through the salvation, uh, through the work of your Son. And God, we pray that that peace uh, will fall upon us. We know that because of Jesus, your favour rests on us, and we pray that right now your peace will be very tangible to us as we know uh, that we are in relationship with a sovereign, caring, and powerful God. Lord, we pray that you will bring peace and joy to our lives. You will bring restoration to the world around us and that many eyes may be lifted up to you this Christmas as we bring glory to God. Help us to do that in our words, in our deeds, in our thoughts and in the settledness of our souls as we rely and trust on you. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace upon all those on whom his favour rests. Amen. The Bible reading today is Luke chapter 15 from verse 11 to verse 20. The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, 
There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between the two of them. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him, and kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. As you've already heard and you're fully aware, we're back in the world of the pre-record. And uh, as we begin to spend our time uh, together in God's word, can I ask that you might join me as we pray? Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and ask that in the midst of all that is going through our minds, we would hear you most clearly. Lord, we pray that you would shine a light that you would illuminate the truth about you and the truth about us and your world and who is in control and what it means to trust in you. And I pray, Lord, that all that I say today will be true. As we reflect upon your word, it would be your spirit and your word guiding and transforming. We ask, Lord, for you to be at work now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, these are dark days. And I'm actually not referring to the days that we're finding ourselves in right now. Uh, We're in the midst of this weekend with another lockdown as COVID-19 comes very close to home on the northern beaches. And we are not able to meet, not able to gather and live stream. And so it can feel dark and it can feel uncertain. And we're surrounded again with a whole lot of disappointments and things to be negotiated and understood. Because this pandemic continues to plague this planet. But the dark days that I mention are those for Isaiah in the passage that we're looking at today. And we have been over this Advent time when we come to Isaiah chapter 9. But in Isaiah, these are dark days that he is encountering some two and a half thousand years ago. Because when Isaiah speaks out his prophecy, the times for God's people, uh, they have been removed from the land, they are under God's judgment. These are dark days for God's people. In fact, you can hear a summary of what those days are like if you were to look at Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 22. It says, then they will look towards the earth. You you notice that they're not looking towards God, but down and all around. Um, They're limited just to this horizontal plane. They will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. It's a terrible picture, isn't it? Thick darkness with people that are groping for answers, looking for some kind of release. There is a kind of desperation. There they are with all of their questions, looking for answers, with all of the uncertainty, and they're looking for illumination. They are dark and in need of light. And it's that picture of utter darkness that sits in the backdrop as you come to Isaiah chapter 9. Because Isaiah seems to stand all alone. His stance is different. Back in chapter 8 and verse 17, he says, I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. And when you stop and think about that distinction, Isaiah trusting in God and the nation looking all around for answers, groping in the darkness, you've got to ask yourself, why all that darkness? And we know in the context of Isaiah's day that it's because the descendants of Jacob have been habitually disobedient. 
They've ignored God, rejected him, and God in judgment has hidden his face from them. And that is a terribly bleak picture. They'd suffer. They'd suffer the defeat of the invading armies and forces around them. Their God will feel like he is far off. This nation that was meant to bear God's name is actually now renowned for its immorality and its oppression and even its superstition. There is a deep faithlessness in Israel at this time. And rather than consult God, look up, they consult mediums which just seems to be the absurd response. It's pointed out to them in chapter 8. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and who mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? See, these are dark days for Israel, looking for answers in places where there are no answers to be found. And all of that sets the backdrop, this very bleak, dark backdrop, for what comes in this chapter, now in chapter 9 of Isaiah. Because Isaiah receives from God uh, the lights. It's, they're, they're turned on. There is great illumination because change is promised. So in chapter 9, verse 1, you hear the word, Nevertheless, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future... He will honour Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. So you're meant to come to this chapter and hear that uh, from the perspective of people in Isaiah's day, it's all not lost. It's dark, it's oppressive, but it's not pitch black. In fact, the light is coming on. Look ahead. In fact, they're encouraged to look ahead as far as 700 years. And in that insignificant region of Galilee, something astonishing is going to happen. God is going to do something. He's going to turn up. And it isn't just good news for them and for that 700 year wait that they'll endure. This is a message that actually speaks good news to any generation that finds itself absorbed in darkness looking for answers and bereft of hope. We are to see that the light has dawned, past tense, that the light was coming into the world. And from our position now, hearing these words in 2020, we're looking back to the time when these promises were indeed fulfilled, when when Galilee was honoured, that little backwater saw God step in to the landscape, born of the virgin born in that lonely manger. And there it was revealed to the world that God was with us, Emmanuel. And all of this was to see the fulfilment of God's ultimate promises that one day he would send a Messiah, his son, Jesus the Christ, the Emmanuel. What we've been celebrating through this Advent season, what it means for God to be with us, And we need to know his presence with us more than ever. And so did Isaiah. That whilst it can seem dark, God is not far off. And so Isaiah speaks out the most incredible and surprising words in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. It is incredible, isn't it? Because you ask, who could achieve that kind of transformation? Could one person really be that significant, this little tiny child? It would take a revolution, wouldn't it, to change the world? It'll take an army to see things changed about. But it's incredible that it's just a child that is born, so humble and so meek, but surprising as well, because you ask, really, a child? Something so weak and insignificant? And yet, those little tiny shoulders will bear the governing of the world. He will be the king above all kings, the Lord above all lords. And you look into that manger and you say, really? And as we've noticed in this sermon series, this one who is born is given by Isaiah a fourfold name. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
And that's because for a world that's steeped in darkness, to a world that's completely lost its way, what is needed? A wonderful counsellor. To see God's strategic plan, that it's at work and he is in control. To see a mighty God, the one with supreme power, who is not against us but for us. And to know the everlasting Father, or as we'll come to see, better translated as the forever Father. And the one, as we'll see on Christmas Day, who is the Prince of Peace, that fully and finally brings peace between us and God. And now for a few moments today, I want us to consider what it means that Jesus is given just one of those names, the name Everlasting Father. Because first up, you'd want to stop and say, that is a strange name to give to a baby, isn't it? Immediately, you look to this tiny little infant and you say, there, everlasting father. Strange. But Isaiah is revealing something about the future of this child, of what this child will do. The baby might look meek and mild, but that child is encapsulating something more. Of course, another issue with this title is, how is the title Father used to talk about the Son of God? Aren't we talking about Jesus, the second person of the Trinity? Is this actually messing with our understanding of the Trinity? This God who manifests himself in three persons as Father, Son and Spirit. There was a first century uh, heresy called modalism that got shot down by the early church fathers because they thought that this was the way that you understood God, all kind of mashed into one, rather than seeing that this verse is actually saying something completely different. The name Everlasting Father is not a reference to the Eternal Father, the first person of the Godhead, but rather to the fatherly attributes that God the Son exhibits. That's why I said before that a better translation is the father forever. There's something about this child that's born that first Christian Christmas that is fatherly. And into this dark world, knowing that Jesus possesses and lavishly dispenses these fatherly concerns, is a way that we get to see that God has turned the lights on. It's the thing that brings great hope and joy to this world when we see how great the light is in his coming. The one who is the everlasting father, the father forever. And so for just a moment now, consider as you look to the birth of Jesus, as you think upon Christmas this year and celebrate, ask yourself, what is this forever father like? And whilst you could say a lot more than I'm about to say, I just want you to consider two things. That this Father forever provides. And that this Father forever loves eternally. Provides and loves eternally. And before I say anything else, I know that the topic of fathers can be a trigger point for some of us. And that's because there's something intimately deep about the relationship that exists between a child and their father. And so for some of us, they are lovely memories. And our fathers were helpful models to us. But for others of us, our fathers were less than they were meant to be. And we've been left hurt and have baggage. But however our fathers have fathered us, and whoever they were or whoever they are, none of them perfectly live up to the standard that we see in Jesus' fatherly care for us. See, in this child that you see born that first Christmas, As he grows into the man, you meet the perfect father. This father who is rightly shepherding his children always. Leading and providing and protecting and sacrificially loving. We're meant to see the perfect picture of what it is to be fathered well when we come to meet Jesus. Remember what I said a moment ago? He's the father forever who provides. And in a sense, there's no limit to all that Jesus provides for us. When you think about the role that he has in creation, everything made by him and for him, and he holds everything together. And so there is this sense in which it's true to say, were it not for Jesus, that none of this would exist. None of us would exist. And so you talk of dark days, but to talk of a world without Jesus is to go back and to think about a time where there is formlessness and chaos He provided you with life and breath 
and purpose and dignity and with boundaries and discipline. You can think about that in a place like Hebrews 12. He's a God who provides endlessly for us in and through Jesus Christ. And you might not give much thought to all that you've been given. But as you look at Christmas gifts this year, think about what it is that God's gift to you was himself in this form, one who would be an everlasting forever father. But the particular provision that I think best we ought to be captivated by is the provision of forgiveness that this father brings because he gives us freely what each one of us desperately needs and what we can't possibly afford. It is a marvel that God, in his incredible love for us, gives to us this rich gift. Paul, when he writes to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, says this, In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. Earlier on, he said, to those that God has adopted as his children, those that he speaks of in verse 5 of Ephesians 1, He is the father to these children and he lavishes what onto his children? Forgiveness. Wonderful acceptance. A fresh start that wipes the slate clean. How was it achieved? It's a redemption that came through his blood. That through this father laying aside his life, dying in our place, we can be adopted as his children. So loved by God. And it's all of grace. It is the perfect gift. It's the willing act of provision that this Father gives to us. We ought to come to this Christmas and be astonished at the compassionate heart of the forever Father for us. Because at great cost to himself, he provides forgiveness. I wonder, do you remember the value of that gift? And how much others need that forgiveness and that gift? So as we look about our community right now and think about all of their needs, this is the primary need to know this forever father and the forgiveness that he provides. But know this as well, because this father forever also loves eternally. You hear that in numerous places as you move through the New Testament. One particularly is where John, in John's gospel, where Jesus is speaking in chapter 15 and verse 9. And he says, as the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Just like the father loves, I love you. Now remain in my love. Here is this love eternally present that's been lavished to us. And you ask, well, who does he love? And you discover that he loves sinners. Broken and messed up people, people walking in darkness who need to see a great light. He loves them. Are you unsure of that? Well, perhaps the best illustration of this is the one that Jesus gives in Luke chapter 15. On that occasion, he's criticized by onlookers because he's befriending and welcoming sinners. And Jesus goes on to talk about what the kingdom of God is like. And he says it's like a lost sheep that wanders off. And such is the love of the shepherd that he leaves the 99 who are safe and goes to retrieve the one. And when the lost is found, there is great rejoicing. It's like the coin that is lost and the lady makes a search of the house. Into the darkness, the lamp is lit so that things can be seen and the coin is found and there is great rejoicing. And then he finishes that story in Luke chapter 15 with the story of two sons. The story of a father who has two sons that are lost. The first of which turns to his father and asks for his share of the inheritance. And when you come to that story, you ask the question, why did that child leave the father's care? And it's because he wanted to live away from the father. He wanted to live like God was not there. He wanted to live in the darkness. He asks his father for the share of the inheritance, which is effectively asking that his father were dead or wishing his father be dead. And then he goes on his own way and he fares terribly by his own. When he rejects the father, the ultimate end that he finds himself 
is destitution, enveloped by darkness, far from home, and wishing for the love and the care of the father that he once wished was dead, was his again. But then he comes to his senses and he calls to mind what his father is like. And even the servants in his father's estate hold a a far better standard of living than he does right now. And so you hear his plan in in verse 18. It says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So there's the plan. Treat me like a slave. Come to the father, treat me like a slave. But as he sets off for home, that's not what happens, is it? You read on in verse 20 of Luke 15. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. There's the picture of the father. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Are you in darkness? What does it look like to come home? Well, the lights go on and there is full, a full reception into the loving arms. And listen to what the father says in verse 22. He said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. There's the heart of the father, the one who has such compassion that even on those that reject him and want to live their own way, he waits expectantly. And still, while the son was a long way off, he sees and runs and embraces. Here is the God who loves eternally. Of course, the other son is just as lost, isn't he? The one who is always there and self-entitled doesn't see what he has, and he too wants the father's things, but he doesn't really want the father. And so he's self-righteous and justified, and the father comes and convicts him of that. And for us, what does it mean as you come to think about God as a father like that? Far off, in darkness, needing to return home, or caught up in your self-righteousness at home, but equally distanced from the father and not receiving his gift his love and his acceptance. Because the last thing to see in all of this is the forever nature of this everlasting father. See, everything that you've ever dreamed of that a father could be, everything that you've wanted for your relationship with your earthly father, Jesus is and will be for you. He is that without end. And he gives what no earthly father can possibly give. And our Messiah will be perfectly fatherlike in the way that he shepherds and leads and loves us forever. Your everlasting father came down that first Christmas to make sons and daughters out of his enemies, those who were in the darkness. And what he has done for his enemies stays done It is everlasting, for the light has come into the world and it has pushed back the darkness. See, this is the Father's gift to us at Christmas, our everlasting Father. It it ought to be incredibly comforting to read that his name will be called Forever Father in Isaiah 9 verse 6. Because once we become a child of Christ's, we are his And his forever. He never leaves. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from his love. Not even death itself. In fact, death will only draw us nearer. So for all of the burdens or the darkness or the shadows we find ourselves in today, come to see this one who is the everlasting father. And praise our God for the eternal security that we find in Christ. But to us this morning, to us this afternoon, the question is this. Have you come home? Are you enveloped in darkness? Will you see the one who is the light? The one who is the forever father? And do you know him this Christmas 
in these dark days, do you know the one who is forever and who is unchanging in his provision and in his eternal love for you? It's my prayer that you do. And we're going to pray to that end right now. Let's pray. Oh, forever, Father, we thank you that you know us and you know what we need and you are the God who is the great provider. We thank you, Lord, particularly for your provision of forgiveness, for we need it. And we come this day with confessing lips and ask, Lord, that you would forgive us for those things that we have done that we ought not to have done and for the good that we didn't do that we ought to have done. Lord, forgive Forgive, Lord, that we might know the freedom that it is to walk in the light. And Lord, remind us of your unending, unfailing, forever love. We thank you that you love with an eternal love. And just like the father in the story of the prodigal son, that which was lost is found. And there is great rejoicing and welcome. And so remind us, Lord, that we wouldn't stay far off but venture home with great optimism and joy, knowing that we receive from you always the welcome of love that is eternal. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, hi, church. We are now going to be singing a song together called Everlasting God. So I hope you can join in. Oh, 
thanks for joining us uh, online today. Um, we want to remind you that we are always praying for you, and if there are ways that we can come alongside of you in any way, please do not refrain from contacting us. You will re be receiving some news in the next few days about potential um, Christmas and Sunday services. Um, we will be um, talking about that and making decisions based on um, government recommendations. But until then, we pray that you would continue to pray for one another, to care for one another, and encourage one another so that you may be reminded of the ever-present love of our everlasting Father. May you go and be safe and know God's comfort and peace. Amen.